the nations was question three. Um, I think we've more or less answered question two. What was your first impression? Was it equal to your expectation? Have we covered that one enough? Number three was the nations. Number four, you know very well both main branches of Neo Advaita. I mean by this Ramana and his followers from one side and Nisargadatta and his followers from another. Do you see any differences between them? Is that a question about differences between Bhagavan and Nisargadatta or a question about differences between their disciples? <laughs> okay. Um, I, I sat with Nisargadatta regularly in the 1970s. When, when I first discovered him, the only book available was I Am That. At that point, I had read Bhagavan's teachings, and as I read I Am That, there, there was a slight difference in terminology, the way he used technical terms, which initially I found to be a little bit off-putting. For example, he would talk about self or consciousness not being the absolute, but there was something prior to them out of which self and consciousness arose, things like this. But there was a, a huge inherent power in the words that came out of the book, and that power dissolved my, wasn't scepticism, but my um, reluctance to adopt a different world view, having been schooled in Ramana's teachings as terminology. I, I found it so strong, so powerful, I couldn't read more than one or two pages. There was, there was some transmission in the words of that book, which affected me very deeply. And I, I learned to ignore the basic differences that seem to exist in terminology between the Sagadatta and Bhagavan. When I went there, um, I asked a lot of questions. Partly it was curious, and partly because he, he encouraged people to argue with him. He liked a good argument. I think his, his medium of instruction was through dialogue. Uh, Ramana Maharshi obviously and clearly preferred to sit in silence and have people be quiet in front of him. Nisargadatta's technique was to make you argue with him, not to convince you that he was right and you were wrong, but to somehow bring you to an awareness that everything you thought, everything you believed, was just a concept. Now, the, the, the way he would do this would be by he'd make you sit in front of him when you first arrived. It wasn't, it wasn't easy to hide at the back. If a new person came, he would say, sit down here next to me. Where are you from? What books have you read? Who is your guru? What meditation do you practice? So you would have to talk about yourself, about your spiritual history, what you believed, what you practiced. And he would make you, without criticizing, he would make you give a big, a big detailed picture of who you were, um, what your spiritual perspective was, your world view, what you were hoping to get out of it, how much you thought you'd accomplished. But while he was doing this, he would also be transmitting some Shakti into you. And this would cause a kind of split inside you. It, it, remember I told you the story of Papaji, how you just I was getting more and more the experience and I was trying to keep one little corner of my brain that was still rational. It, it's the same thing. So he, he would make you talk simply to keep this portion of your brain active, to give a verbal conceptual construction of who you were and what the world was. And at the same time, he was very slowly and very subtly giving you the direct experience of what was prior to the concepts. So, somewhere in the course of these conversations, you, you could see it on people's faces. There would be the, um, you know, my brain, my brain is over here and my experience is somewhere else. I'm having a very good experience. And a moment would come when you'd have to choose. Without saying directly, he would present two things to you. 
This is your picture of who you are. This is all the beliefs that you brought into my room. And this experience I'm giving you now is who you really are. He never said choose. But you could just see inside people, this is real, this is not real. <laughs> this is the truth, this is a concept. And if, if, if you got it, I mean, you'd laugh or you'd just throw, it, throw, it, throw your concepts and you'd just sit there and be happy and stop talking. And if you didn't, you'd just carry on asking stupider and stupider questions, trying to elaborate on your theories, trying to justify yourselves. Some people really are stuck in their mind and they can't, even when they're getting you know, a direct, strong experience in front of a jnana who can give it to you, they won't let go of their silly ideas. So it, it, was, it was wonderful to watch. Some people would come, they'd just talk for a couple of minutes and they'd laugh and they'd be quiet, they'd get the point. Some people would talk for half an hour with this big, this is me, this is my world, this is my picture, this is my belief. And then they'd slow down and then you know, they'd laugh and get it as well. And there were some that they'd just come in every day and argue and argue and argue and they never got it. And you felt quite sorry for them. Um, he was giving the direct experience there all the time um, but somehow by encouraging you to dabble in all these words the people who were addicted to words got stuck there and they never really got the point of what he was talking about so this from what I witnessed was a major difference between the Sagadatta and Bhagavan Bhagavan unless he was directly asked he wouldn't give you spiritual advice he wouldn't um, ask you to talk about yourself except in, in the usual polite South Indian way he might say where have you come from have you got a nice room, have you eaten but the, the normal exchange to make sure a guest is comfortable that would be the limit L Lakshmanaswami for example um, actually got enlightened <laughs> in Bhagavan's presence um, went back the next day and the only thing Bhagavan said is where are you from he said, I'm from Goodall, that's in Mellor district, yes. And that was the only conversation the two of them had. I mean, this is a man who came, came to Bhagavan, realised the self, an amazing experience. And the only thing they talk about the next day is, where are you from? It's like he wasn't a big talker, he didn't try to make you talk. He said, my teachings, my instructions are only for people who don't know how to sit quietly and absorb and experience my real teachings which is the transmission of silence which is coming up all the time. So two different methods to get people back to the silence. With Bhagavan, you just sat there or he looked at you and automatically your questions would drop, your doubts would drop and you'll be quiet. When you went to see Nisargadatta, he was a much more extrovert character, more forceful, he would challenge you, he would make you talk, make you argue. But at the same time, he was also giving you the experience and he was hoping that you would talk yourself into a position where you could just see, this is all stupid, I don't need these words, I don't need these concepts, throw them away. The first and probably the only word of Marathi most of us ever learned sitting with Nisargadatta was Kalpana. Kalpana means concept. So you'd be sitting there asking your stupid mental question and he just he, he, would ba he, would, he was sitting cross-legged on the floor he would just bang his fist and go Kalpana! 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 and that was the only answer you'd ever get so we all learned that was the end of that question when he did that he just wouldn't answer it